I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and today I'm speaking with Danny McBride, the creator, star, writer, and executive producer of the HBO series, The Righteous Gemstones. Uh, first question I want to ask is, uh, you know, it's such an interesting subject to do like a satire on this, you know, the uh, evangelical megachurch culture. Uh, do you have a connection, a personal connection to that culture uh, uh, that made you say you wanted to, uh, you know, explore this for a comedy show? You know, I did. Uh, growing up, I never had a connection to sort of like the mega church concept. Like I grew up in like a, uh, a really small, like, you know, going to a Southern Baptist church in, in Virginia. Uh, you know, I grew up going to church. My family was involved with church. So, you know, it was a big part of my childhood. And uh, yeah, as I grew older and I moved out of my house, moved to Los Angeles and I just, you know, I, you know, I guess I probably stopped going to church, you know, around right around high school and you know, my parents kind of drifted from the church and it was just something I hadn't done in a while. And I moved to Charleston, South Carolina about five years ago. And when I got here, I just saw how many churches were around this town and even the radio stations. I mean, every other station is a religious station. There's churches everywhere. And it kind of just reminded me of when I was a kid of going to church. It just made me curious of like, what's church like now? You know, it's, it had been so long since I'd been. And as I started researching and seeing these churches, it just instantly kind of intrigued me. I just like this concept of a mega church and this concept of like ministers that like behave like rock stars. It all just felt like it was like right for the kind of comedy that we like to, to get our hands dirty with. And uh, yeah, and you, you said, uh, Virginia, you were in Spotsylvania County, right? That's right. Yep. I'm in, I'm in Arlington County. So, you know. Oh, uh, there you go. Right up the street. <laughs> yep. Uh, I, I go through it every time I have to go to Richmond. <laughs> yeah, um, that's right. Uh, so the other the, the sort of question that I want to piggyback off of that is, you know, it's uh, how did you find the right tone when making a series that was satirizing this? Because it could be so easy to go overboard into, you know, like a mocking ridicule uh, tone. And so I, I was wondering how you found that tone. You know, I think with all of it, it's like, you know, with Jody and David Hill, with Jody Hill and David Green and the writers like John Kachuri, Jeff Brown, and these guys that I've worked with from Eastbound and Down, it isn't so much that you're, we don't want to embrace cliches, but it's always like trying to find the thing that's a little bit more interesting to like poke fun at, you know, it's like people have so many conceptions of what the South is. And I think we like to sort of satirize the South in like a more unique way. I don't know if it's just like, playing off of the nuance of it and not like playing up the hayseed hillbilly aspect of it. But that's always how we've approached shooting things in the South and telling stories set in the South. So I think we wanted to have the same concept with the church is that at the end of the day, when we make any of our, you know, stuff that's set in North Carolina, we're not trying to make it offensive where someone in North Carolina, like wouldn't want to watch it. It's like they, hopefully someone in North Carolina would identify it as like, Oh, they, they're like, that feels regional and it feels authentic. So for us, that was always the goal is like, we don't want to make something that, any, that someone who's religious has no interest in seeing because it feels like they're the butt of the joke. We want it to feel like it's set in a world that they would recognize, but then just make it our own and, and inject a story and characters that are, you know, just compelling to watch. And I, I think that way you don't isolate your audience and it, it actually invites the people that know these kind of churches to come and sit down and, and have a watch. So I think one of the most interesting things about this show, uh, and one of the most pleasant uh, things about this show is um, uh, the uh, is Edie Patterson as Judy. She is, uh, I, it, she, I, I think just based on this scene, this, I think it's certifiably insane, but it's absolutely the most wonderful way possible. Uh, what was the process like of casting her to play Judy? You know, I always knew that Edie was gonna be in this show. I first worked with Edie, on vice principals and uh, just had an absolute blast with her. It was one of those things, like it was like a moment, like when I worked with Steve Little on the first, on, on Eastbound, it's like, it was just someone who like, no matter what they say, it just makes me laugh. And that their sensibilities run similar to what I like, where I like comedic performances that feel grounded and feel real. And for whatever reason, you're sort of like drawn into the character, even though they're like be behaving horribly and doing stuff that's terrible. Edie has that ability. She has that charm and uh, I don't know, and range that she can really draw you into the character, but then can also just make you laugh your ass off when you see how far she's willing to go. And uh, 
I just admire it. I think it's like, I think it's fun working with people who are wired that way. And uh, so I always wanted Edie to be a, a, a part of the show. And when I was originally writing the pilot of it, uh, at one point it wasn't going to be about like a big family. It was going to be about like one minister and his wife and he was navigating an affair. And, uh, and Edie was going to play that role. And re weirdly, like when I started writing it, I felt like it wasn't funny enough for her. Like I felt like the dynamic of her and I just being husband and wife wasn't like really allowing her to be able to go as far comedically as I knew she could. So I weirdly started trying to adjust the family dynamic because of that. I wanted to find something that she could sort of go nuts on. And so the idea of us being siblings just started making me laugh more and more. And the idea that we could go hard at each other, it just felt right. It felt like it was a fun dynamic. Um, you know, to uh, go to another side of this in terms of uh, the cast on the show, uh, this is uh, yet another uh, collaboration that you've done with uh, Walton Goggins, uh, who plays Baby Billy on the show. I always think that's such a ridiculous name, but I think that's probably the point. Um, and, I, I'm, and what I'm wondering about is uh, you've worked with him uh, for years now, and I'm wondering how did the relationship, how did the relationship between you two come about? You know, I had, I, I had been a fan of Walton's work and had definitely noticed him before. I mean, he's such an intriguing actor. And um, he actually came in to read for one season of Eastbound, uh, season three. And we ended up casting Jason Sudeikis in the role that he was going to play. But he really just stuck with me so much. I mean, the fact that he, like, watched the show and was interested in it and instantly in the few minutes I met him in that audition, I just liked him. I, I instantly felt something uh, towards him. And we were shooting... This is the end down in New Orleans a few years later. And he was down there shooting Django and I ran into him then. And it was just another one of those moments where I was like, man, I really like this guy. I, you know, I hope we get an opportunity to work together someday. And um, yeah, as I wrote Vice Principals and I was trying to figure out who could play this, uh, his name just came up between me and David and Jody. And I was like, this could be it. This could be the opportunity to kind of get to work with this guy. And so, yeah, I, I sent him the scripts and, you know, he called me back a few hours later and just started talking to me on the phone as he, as if he were Lee Russell, who's the character he ended up playing in Vice Principals. And uh, he just was making me instantly laugh. And I knew I had like, you know, I knew I had the right man. And he's just another one like Edie. I'm just so enamored with their talents and their abilities as, as performers that, it just makes writing for them a lot of fun because it's just like what, like as just being a genuine fan of both of theirs, it's just sort of nice to be able to create and see what the hell they're going to do with it at the end of the day. Uh, what kind of presence does someone like John Goodman, uh, who I think of as like this giant of performing, because he's been, you know, I've been watching him since I was a kid. Uh, what type of presence does he bring to that set uh, when he's on there. Oh, I, you know, when we definitely were, when we were first shooting, it, my cat is attacking me, I'm sorry, let me grab him. He's, uh, he's a big John Goodman fan. He, uh, this, uh, you know, when, he, when we first cast him, I think all of us were just sort of amazed that he was in it. You know, I think all of us were, were massive fans of his and I've been a, a big fan of his for a while. I mean, his career is just so interesting because, you know, he was, working in TV when TV wasn't even cool to work in. And he was doing TV and blockbusters and showing up in Coen Brothers movies. And he's just always been a voice and a talent that I've always admired. And so when it came to like casting Eli and we got, we hooked him. I mean, I think we were all just sort of like blown away. And so I think when we were shooting the first season, we were all intimidated and just didn't want to look dumb in front of him, you know, and then as the season went on and we got to know him more and more and got to be more comfortable, uh, it just became a very nice part about the job. It was like, you're going there and you're laughing and you're getting to know a guy like John Goodman better each day. And also just getting to see how he works and what he does. And uh, yeah, it's been, it's been so nice. It's been like a really cool part of this process. So what's another thing that's interesting about this show is, you know, how, um, uh, you know, the, the gemstones can be at the same time, they can be very wrapped up in this materialistic thing, but then also you, you're also liking them because you also like the family dynamic of them. And I'm all, and I'm curious as to, in your eyes, where do you see the gemstones on a scale of morality? You know, uh, 
you know, that's the thing with the Genesis one. I feel like there's the kids, especially the kids are so entitled. And I think that they suffer from the fact that their parents like put more energy into building this church than to like raising them, you know, and that's sort of the irony of the gemstones is that they're getting paid lots of money to tell people how to live. And then they have so many blind spots in their own lives. Uh, you know, I think that ultimately they think that they're the good guys. I think they think that they're living, that they're doing right and that they're, you know, making the right choices and that they're doing what needs to be done to get there. But obviously that, uh, the, their morals and the reality of the situation is it's far between. I, I feel like the one who has the biggest uh, conscience of it is, is Amy Lee. Like I think Amy Lee knows that the family is going down a path that's not right, you know, and that's sort of, as we get into these interlude episodes and start to see more of the family history and how they got here, that's sort of what we start seeing a little bit more of in three is like how, of how the gemstones arrived here and how the people that were in charge, Eli and Amy Lee, how they sort of, you know, they change their, their goals at the end of the day. Like they, they set out to build churches and then they ended up building empires and it, and, and, and things change when you, when you shift like that. So uh, another thing I'm curious about is, um, you know, it's sometimes, sometimes some shows have take a, take a little while to find their footing and there can be sometimes a very big uh, change in how it feels making the show from season one to season two. And I was wondering what were some of the big changes that you felt in, uh, in making that transition other than the pandemic? <laughs> you know, the, the pandemic was kind of the main one, you know, it's like, Creatively, a lot of these people behind the camera are people I've made Eastbound with and vice principals. And so we we understand how, like, you know, we, the process is very similar for all of them. Uh, but the pandemic was what it was because I think when we finally were able to shoot, you know, we were supposed to start shooting in 2020. We had shot for two days uh, and then that, then everything shut down for the pandemic. And then we were out for almost a year. So I feel like when we came back, there was a level of like, oh, it's fun to be back shooting the gemstones. But there was also a level of like, we've been sitting on our asses for a year. And it's like nice to get back into the world and, and sort of do what it is you love to do. So I think that despite all the protocols and despite, you know, how it was a little precarious to be out in the world shooting scenes with 300 extras at a mega church, you know, like when the, when the pandemic was still raging, we somehow weathered it and, uh, and it somehow felt all worth it. It just was, it was nice to be able to, it was a nice answer to being so isolated for a year to be able to like get back on set with all of these familiar faces and just try to make something hopefully that was going to just entertain people. You know, I know I was sitting here in my house with like nothing to watch. And so I think that was like part of what it felt like when we were getting out there shooting was like, oh good, finally we'll be able to give people some new shit. You know, <laughs> like I know I need it. <laughs> So um, uh, I know we're going to be getting a third season at some point, and I know that you know you, you obviously you know you can't you're not going to spoil anything. But what direction might we be seeing this family going in the upcoming third season? Well, you know, we, you are going to get a third season. We start shooting in a little less than a month, uh, so we're 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 back at it in there. But I mean, I think that like ultimately, this is a you know, it's it is a show about a dynasty. It's about a family, and it's about this transition of when the people who built it handed over the people who didn't, and that's sort of what we're watching here. We're watching, you know. Uh, are these, are these, uh, you know, are these gemstone children capable of running this? And, and, you know, at the same time, like, how did they get here? Like, how did things end up this way? And that's the, the ongoing story that we continue to explore. Well, uh, Danny, uh, thank you so much for joining us. We wish you all the best over this upcoming award season. And to all of our viewers, please like, share, subscribe, smash that subscribe button. And don't forget to go to goldderby.com to make your Emmy predictions. Thanks so much, Danny. Thank you, Charlie. Have a great day, man. See ya.